right? Is that clear that everybody has the yes. same amount of money? Not clear to anyone? Don't be hesitating. All right, now, as the game progresses, it goes into a bell-shaped curve, but the people on the right have more money. You can pause it, Bert. I'm sorry? You can press pause in the center at the bottom. Center the double bar. So the people on the right have more staying power. So as the game proceeds, it's going to become more and more unequal. In the Bible, they call it the Matthew effect. The, them that has are those who gets. The rich get richer. Okay. Now, there's also a paradox in that way. The rich get richer, and then rags to riches to rags in three generations, which is something else. But the point is that in any game of chance, that is a perfect game of chance, this change in the distribution of wealth is going to occur. What is unique, aside from that, is the fact Why should it go into that symmetrical curve? There's nothing saying that it should be that curve. And that we know that that curve, under ideal circumstances, is, is function x is equal to e raised to the power of minus pi x squared. It's at cause. There's no cause at all. And it's fundamental. So we have any perfect game of chance is going to move from complete equality to symmetrical inequality in a known distribution. And because of that inequality, it's going to get more and more unequal. That is a causal and is a natural law as far as I'm concerned and a natural law that all, all of us have to be familiar with. Can I have your comments on this and how this strikes you? Yes. Um, uh, somewhere in there, I realized I've been reading the same stuff you have because like, if you've paid attention, it's in some corners, there are deep discussions in our current market scenario what caused it. And there are people who say, it wasn't caused. And that goes to the whole question of exogenous um, events driving changes versus endogenous. Right. And if you're looking for the opposite of causality, it's inevitability. Yes. This is a systemic inevitability. It doesn't cause it. The structure of what you put in front of you leads you to this outcome. Correct. And in turn, and, and by the way, in, in a society that deeply believes in um, master of your own destiny, this can be a very hard sell. Not only a hard, I mean... It, the I, very idea that it's more important what game you play than how you play the game. Yes. Well, this is really the basis of why I want to talk to you about science fiction. Because it really is another phase. And it is a very pessimistic thing. It really, in a closed game, you have an example of what's happening with Darwinian evolution. The, the players in the tail, by law, have a unique characteristic that if this game continues, at least until they die, they have staying power. They have a, they're a species that can succeed. For most of my career, I could not discuss this with anyone. It's only now that I can, I can even show you this because it, I, I couldn't get anyone, I shouldn't say that completely, maybe what, 20 years ago was it? Maybe 21 years ago, a friend of mine, I, I asked him, could he program this? And he did and verified what I had in mind. But it, uh, what's happened in the marketplace today is that we have, uh, in the last 15 years, a field called econophysics. And I find it really quite intriguing because 
uh, many of the econophysicists don't know that the origin of what they're philosophizing came from psychology. Uh, and I, I find that part intriguing. But they're dealing with too much complexity. And if something like this is a reality, if we don't start teaching it very early in, in a child's career, you're going to be so conditioned on causality that if you can reject this, you're going to reject it. It's too uncomfortable. So well, up until the time my wife died, I was focused on trying to get free, free of money controlling my behavior. That meant to me to form a skimming fund. And I was very lucky, and it's, uh, these are stories that I can tell, but I was lucky in, in having ability at the right time in doing certain things. And not fortunate in being able to explain to my family what I'm doing. <laughs> but, and for my wife, it was like living with someone who was a race car driver and having one heck of a time, and she's in the passenger seat doing this because it you can recognize how risky the whole thing is. Was. And uh, I always was looking for academics that I could discuss this with, uh, quite unsuccessfully. And, but so my time up until about 20 years ago was gathering information, trying to communicate it, and trying to apply it. After I lost Lori, uh, really, uh, I'd lost. This was my, I thought, was the center of my life. It wasn't, my wife was the center of my life. And I couldn't have cared less about all this stuff. It could. But I had to find purpose. And I don't know how many years, it must have been five years. And my children got married. They had children. And I'm the type of person who journals, as Jill knows. <laughs> and so, in searching for purpose, I thought, well, I lost love, and I knew I loved my children, so that's purpose. And one morning I woke up, and with thinking to myself, if my children or my grandchildren, grandchildren when they were old enough, ever asked me, uh, you know, Grandpa, haven't you learned anything in your lifetime that you want us to know so we don't have to spend a lifetime relearning it? The answer was yes, but the problem was how. And really, for the last 15 years, and I can't believe it's that long, I've been looking for the how. And the meeting here has to do with the how and the conclusions I've come to. And I believe that Flatland provided an analogy. Uh, the, the square goes to Spearland, and I have, in, including in the data that I've sent you, uh, perhaps we might go to that for a moment. Would you go on with your Which one, Bert? Uh, this is uh, the characters, the hierarchy, the peculiarities. It's two dimensional that you have to know if you have yeah. I've, I've, I've read enough of the source material to know what it's about. Yeah. So here you have a two dimensional land with the key character, A squared. I don't know if, by the way, in, in the statement, in our, my time, you're a square. I don't know if they say that anymore. I don't know if it has anything to do with Flatland. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I wondered. Interesting. But the, <laughs> the square uh, encounters a circle that changes in size and asks, what are you? He says, I'm a sphere. He says, what's a sphere? He says, well, you really want to know? I can take you to Spearland, and, and this is what happens. He goes to Spearland, and of course, his he, mind's blown, and he had, perceives the concept of up. That's why I have up, <laughs> up here. And then returns. And there are laws within Spearland about, in uh, Flatland, what you can discuss and you can't, and you're not supposed to be discussing anything you with up. But he questions his own sanity, and he's trying to explain to those he loves and to his grandchild. And of course, how in the world does he share up 
with anybody who has an experienced doctor. And in my case, I experienced the causal. I believe in what, I sh what I've shown you here. This is very real for me. I still may be wrong, but it's very real to me. And it's the basis under which I try to lead my life. Because as far as I'm concerned, if that happens, it becomes obligatory in anyone in the tail, if they want the game to go on, to redistribute money. Not necessarily through the government, because the government's in the game. Yes. And they just take more, and there, there's no discipline. So one has to create different rules of the game. So if, if today you were bringing Flatland up to date, and you're aware of what Abbott and uh, couldn't have known, I, I perhaps we'll review some of these for you. And I was wondering how to go about it. I don't like reading things, but would it be convenient if I asked people to go around the table and read a paragraph, paragraph and we'll just talk about it? Can everybody see it? Could, could, mm -hmm. uh, would you mind starting? Sure. Both A square and the sphere would have to learn how to see in each other's land. Their conditioning in the lands they inhabit would determine what they see. Perception is learned. A square would probably not see what the sphere sees in sphere land and would have to learn to see up. A square may never be successful in seeing up. Conditioning in youth at a critical age may be so strong as to not be undone. All right, so just take that paragraph. If, if we, if we just take that paragraph, is that within Flatland, Abbott would just take for granted that uh, if when the square went to sphere land, he would see what the, what the sphere sees. But our, all our psychology literature shows that based on the environment in which we're in and how we are physically designed and our perceptual system and how we are conditioned determines what we see. So there's no assurance that the sphere coming to Flatland would see what a Flatlander would see and there's no assurance that a Flatlander would see what a sphere sees when he goes to sphere land. Further, that that conditioning starts very early in life. And, and, and once conditioned may not be undoable. It, you see that, that part? Right. So, it, taking the analogy to the causal and a causal, it, it would mean that how in the world we're sitting here, I've had an a causal experience. I'm sitting with a, a group of people that may not have had an a causal experience. I find that my colleagues who teach this subject matter uh, may not have had the money experience that I've had, which contributes to what I see and how I see it. Uh, the topic we're talking about uh, relates to Ian Hacking's uh, The Taming of Chance. Have, has anyone read this? No. It's hard to find. Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I found it recently, actually. I'm um, trying to remember exactly what the website is, but I can get it. I think we get it. Is it on the web? Electronic or physical? Oh, phys like to buy it. Okay, I'll buy it. Well, now, The Taming of Chance, written by Ian Hackey, who's a professor of philosophy at the university and <coughs> is world renowned and world honored, uh, he wrote it in 1990. It's quite, it's quite, quite a title, the, the Taming of Chance. And in it, he writes, that, and it's not a book that for the average person to read. I don't mean they don't have the ability, they don't have the background. But this book was voted one of the most important nonfiction books out of 100 nonfiction books in the 20th century. And within it, his chapter 21 has, a, a, is on the autonomy of statistical law relates to what we're talking about. So I would expect that Ian would follow up on that. But Ian, in talking to him, uh, would say, well, that's old hat. I'm going on to something else. <laughs> that's like finding an oil well. Not, not, not.